Um, cool. All right, I'll just share my screen. Cool. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, to Jack and, and everyone who's organizing Coast to Coast um, for inviting me. And, and thank you to those who are coming along to listen today. Um, so today I'm going to be talking um, a little bit about um, management of intermittently open and closed estuaries, um, as well as quite a bit about their entrance processes. Um, so this presentation today um, is kind of uh, summarizing a lot of the field work um, that I've been doing over the last 10 years or so uh, in Victoria, and also trying to uh, apply some of those findings um, to better assist uh, decisions around uh, estuary entrance management. So in particular, trying to look at the factors that cause estuaries to close off really quick after they've been artificially opened um, and try to use that information to uh, avoid that. So just as a brief intro, um, intermittently open and closed estuaries, um, as Jack said, they go by lots of different acronyms globally, um, but essentially they're any estuary that uh, has periodic uh, entrance closure. So this site here um, is the Jolly Run River estuary uh, in Western Victoria, um, one which is really spectacular and beautiful, um, and that I've spent quite a bit of time uh, doing field work. So you can see here on the bottom, uh, it's closed because there's a berm formed across the mouth, and then on our top picture here, it's open. So these estuaries undergo um, seasonal um, or even more regular cycles uh, of opening uh, and closure. So just a bit of background uh, to entrance processes. So when these estuaries are open, like you can see uh, here with Anglesey Estuary in Victoria, it's all about this um, balance between competing uh, energies from the catchment uh, and marine side. So when they open, we tend to have periods of high river flow uh, punch through the berm, and then we have um, basically ebb tidal currents uh, being able to beat out um, our sediment brought onshore by waves. So a net direction of sediment transports offshore. And then on the flip side, when we see these uh, systems close, it's when we have high wave energy that basically can beat out erosional uh, currents in the entrance and drive sediment uh, onshore. So there's a lot of these uh, estuaries around the world that intermittently close. Um, and some of the work I did in my PhD <clears throat> was looking at the boundary conditions for their formation. So essentially, uh, to get an estuary to close, we need a few things. The first of all is we need consistent high wave energy. So we tend to see them found um, in our wave dominated settings around the world. That's because they need enough uh, wave energy to, to build the berm across the entrance. Because of that reason too, we also see them in areas with small tidal ranges. We need to have areas which have variable or low river discharge. So again, about those competing energies, it allows our sediment brought on shore by waves uh, to stabilize across the entrance. And because of that, um, it's reflected in climate. We tend to see these estuaries most common in temperate uh, and semi-arid climates where we get variability in rainfall and river flow. So recently, um, I've been adding to this data set. Uh, originally, we found about uh, 1,500 intermittent estuaries around the world which are our spots uh, here in black on this map. But just adding to this um, data set over time, largely uh, when I'm procrastinating from doing other things, is actually now we've found about uh, 2,170 estuaries uh, around the world that close. So this is probably due to getting uh, more regular imagery um, since our 2017 study. But essentially they're really common um, in wave dominated settings and on rivers with variable flow because that all relates uh, to the entrance processes. And so on our microtidal coast, now they comprise about 20% uh, of all estuaries. And they have a variety of forms, um, just a few examples from around the world uh, down the bottom. So they're really diverse in terms, uh, in terms of their size, um, their shape, and also their opening and closure regimes. So in terms of opening processes, naturally um, intermittent estuaries will open when we have um, high rainfall and river flow. 
So processes coming from the catchment uh, most commonly drive their openings. This example here is from the Jellybrand River uh, in Victoria. And here, after a period of high rainfall, we had a natural channel cut through the berm, and then that drained um, the estuary. They can also open due to marine processes. So when we get wave overtopping, um, add water to the, the little goon, and we might get seepage or sapping uh, through the berm, like we can see here. So this is most common when the estuaries are really full and really perched above sea level, and often on coarser grained uh, beaches as well. But most relevant to my talk, um, mainly because of the management um, issues surrounding this, is artificial openings. So artificial openings um, are where people will come in with excavators or diggers um, and dredge a channel out uh, to the ocean. So there's a few reasons why this is done. Um, it's undertaken to allow fish to go out to the ocean sometimes. It's undertaken for water quality issues, but most commonly um, to mitigate against flooding. That's because um, all the water will back up behind the berm and that will flood out areas um, around the floodplain, which oftentimes is where people like to build roads um, and put their nice uh, holiday homes. So just an example of some of these issues here. Um, this site um, and this opening is one that happened back in 2020 at the Air River, um, which again is in our Western Victoria. And this opening was prompted um, because of flooding. So we had residents who lived close to the, the edge of the lagoon um, getting separated from, uh, well, their roads were getting flooded and they weren't able to cross uh, bridges and get uh, into work. We also had um, farmers who had land that was uh, getting flooded by this water hanging around on the floodplain. So it actually killed off about 1,500 uh, acres uh, of farmland. And so there's a lot of uh, tension with this. Um, basically, the, it was open so late that it was really hard um, for the managers to get their excavators in. But when it did open, um, it was really uh, spectacular. So when we see, um, or after we have artificial openings um, being implemented, we see some really uh, impressive geomorphic change. And it's been really great uh, to be able to get out into the field and see um, these processes which change so quickly. So for example, we get really big standing waves in the channel. We get supercritical flow and periods where the lagoon drains are really quickly, which is shown by this drop uh, in water level here. But sometimes um, openings don't always work like that. We don't see periods of rapid drainage, and sometimes they can even fail uh, outright. So here's an example of one at the Air River. We saw the channel being excavated in the morning. Um, within an hour later, it had, had actually filled in the whole channel here because of these big waves. And this is us um, here surveying uh, in the picture. And then over the next couple of days, um, it basically built up the beach by an extra meter or so. So some of the motivation for my work, um, working with councils and CMAs has been largely to think about why does this happen and to try to do some research uh, to give advice on how we can avoid it. So openings fail outright like this. They can close within uh, a few hours, but we can also have situations where even though the opening might stay open, it's basically just a little trickle out like this bottom picture here. And then oftentimes, as soon as we get big waves come along, um, that mouth will shut again. So two scenarios here where we have openings that don't really achieve their management purpose. The first is when it closes outright um, like here, and then we need to have implementation a few days later to get those flood borders off the floodplain. And then our second scenario, um, which isn't really talked about so much, is when we have it open, but it really doesn't drain more than 10 centimetres uh, or so. So in this situation here, it's essentially not uh, achieving its management aim uh, of reducing flooding. And then oftentimes we'll close a few, a few days later. <clears throat> So my research has been really motivated um, by this, trying to, trying to figure out why these situations happen. And just for context, each of these artificial openings uh, in Victoria costs about two to $10,000. And on average, we have about 30 uh, of them happen across the state annually. So a huge amount of money and time um, you know, is, is lost if we need to come in and re-implement openings uh, frequently. And we also run the risk of adverse um, effects to the environment. 
So the research questions that um, I'm going to talk about today uh, is, first of all, why does the mouth close uh, after artificial openings? So those situations that we just saw, why does that happen? Secondly, can we predict when artificial, artificial openings will be successful? So providing thresholds and guidance um, to make sure they're implemented at the right time. And then what is the sequence of geomorphic change that happens during openings? So how quickly does the channel um, in, in size and expand? Um, how quickly does it drain? And basically, um, what determines those rates of change? So that has a management <clears throat> implication as well, because we want the, the basin to drain, we want the, the estuary to open and go through the whole sequence, but we don't want the basin to drain so quickly that it can cause things like fish kills. So this is actually quite a, a complex issue and it's quite hard to get the balance right. And then lastly, um, because we've been looking at uh, lots of different estuaries across the state um, that have different morphologies, do all estuaries follow the same temporal uh, sequence of change uh, during openings? So first of all, why does the mouth close after some artificial openings? So we've been to about uh, 20 openings um, in the last uh, eight years or so. And out of those, about four of them that we've observed uh, have failed. And so there's a couple of reasons why this can happen. So our first reason is like we saw um, at the Air River, the one that shut within an hour. Basically, we have such high waves offshore that they bring in enough sediment um, that infills the channel. Our second reason, which again, isn't really talked about so much, um, is when we don't have enough energy behind our outflow. So it's opened maybe with low hydraulic head and it really just doesn't reach velocities um, that are going fast enough to maintain offshore sediment transport. And then our last one is when we have a combination of both. So that's what's happening in this picture here um, at Curdie's Inlet. We've got pretty big waves which are bringing on sediment and infilling the channel here. But coupled with that, we also have our flow which doesn't really have enough energy to incise. It's not really doing any work in the channel and moving sediment uh, offshore. So in, in thinking about this, what we wanted to do um, was to come up with a way to predict that whether once we open an estuary, um, can we tell or can we predict how it will stay open or if it will stay open and drain its lagoon. So essentially, even though there's lots of other considerations that go into opening decisions, this really is just a physical uh, process. So we should, in theory, be able to predict it. So to take a step back first, before we try to answer that, um, I just want to talk a bit about the current uh, management. So obviously the decision whether to open estuaries or not is really complex. There's lots of different factors involved um, and lots of different stakeholders too. So in Victoria, at least, um, when they're trying to decide whether to open estuaries or not, the managers look at risks versus benefits. So they have um, you know, quite a complex system where they weigh up whether it's worth opening the system or not versus um, you know, is it going to cause, does it have potential to cause some bad environmental effects? They also look at forecast rainfall and wave heights. They try to not open during high waves and they try to open when we have um, periods of high rainfall predicted. They also look at practical aspects. So things like, do we have contractors who are available on the day? But largely, this decision is um, determined by the estuary water level. So oftentimes when our water level gets to a certain um, elevation on the gauge board or starts to inundate certain infrastructure, um, that's when the decision to open estuaries will be made. And so what we think or what we thought here is that there's quite a bit of scope actually for physical processes uh, and geomorphology to be included uh, in this decision making process. Um, whether it's actually, you know, the, the main thing for the decision um, or not, it's really just something that um, hasn't been included, um, like in detail. And also in thinking about this, um, because water level is really what's used a lot of the time to make this decision, um, it's only really one part of the picture in terms of physical processes in the channel. It's all about these driving versus resisting forces, um, which really are likely going to swing it to being successful um, or closing off. So our question here is, can we predict when openings uh, will be successful? So in terms of successful, I mean they will stay uh, open after they've been excavated, 
and they'll also drain their lagoon um, to reduce flooding. So we're thinking about this uh, conceptually, and this is um, just a kind of schematic diagram here of our estuary, um, our berm and our ocean. So we use the water level quite often to determine whether, um, or to, to think about um, when the estuary needs to be opened. But in reality, it's this force here, our hydraulic head, which is our difference between the estuary and the sea level, that's really promoting or driving the breaching. So that's gonna be pushing water um, in the direction of out to the ocean. But also opposing that, we have this force resisting the breaching, which is our length uh, or breadth of our berm here. And so the berm length is something that isn't really um, considered uh, when thinking about implementing openings. It's usually the height which gets a bit more attention. And so what we thought here um, is if we were to able, if we were able to combine those two um, forces here, we might be able to predict whether openings will be successful um, in terms of the flow having enough energy to erode sediment out of the mouth. So when we divide our, uh, our hydraulic head here by our berm length, uh, we can get our energy gradient or hydraulic gradient here in meters per meters. So that's essentially the energy gradient or energy slope um, between the estuary here uh, and the ocean. And just to simplify things and put it in kind of a more um, imaginable uh, variable, if we divide one by the hydraulic gradient, we get our grade. So that might be a one in 50 or a one in 60 grade um, for opening. So we wanted to uh, take this idea and test it. So what we did is we did a lot of literature mining. Um, we used some really good citizen science data uh, for New South Wales and Victoria. And we also used um, our field monitoring, where we'd go out and measure some variables um, before openings. And so we collected data to um, calculate the hydraulic gradient and grade um, at the time of opening for 137 openings um, at 37 sites in Australia, South Africa, uh, and the USA. So some of them had things like the water level, the berm length um, in that, and others might have just had the, the grade or gradient as it had been calculated in literature. Most of them were able to have all those variables so we could then uh, compare between openings. And so here's just some of the, the locations where we got data um, for. And most of these settings uh, have pretty similar uh, wave conditions. They also have similar climate conditions and all the beaches where the estuaries are tend to have uh, medium grain sand. So we're able to compare um, between these openings. And so what we did first of all is we looked at um, evidence in literature and photos and also changes in water level for most of these openings um, and classified them as successful and unsuccessful. So successful again is one that stayed open um, and it drained its basin to achieve its management purpose. And ones that were unsuccessful were either um, our twos, which uh, didn't stay open at all after excavation, and our threes, which were the ones that kind of just trickled out, didn't reduce the water level by any more than 10 centimeters, um, and then closed off in a few days. So here's just some of the, the distributions um, of the physical variables we're able to capture for these 137 or so sites. So here's our, our distribution for successful openings and unsuccessful, and these are splitting them into um, our categories where twos and threes um, are the ones that were unsuccessful. So what we saw here is that in terms of our successful openings, we have this range um, you know, of water levels at which it worked, and then we were able to pull out a range of ones that were unsuccessful. And so looking at this here, we can see this the really big um, level of overlap when thinking about water level um, is splitting out between successful and unsuccessful openings. And so that's quite important because that's, you know, a lot of times what the decision to open is based on, but it's not really a good predictor um, of whether openings will be successful or not. And in fact, all these variables here that we have, um, our hydraulic head, our berm length and our offshore wave height, again, showed a really big degree of overlap between successful and unsuccessful openings. So what this tells us is that it's not just looking at one single factor alone. Um, and so what we wanted to do next was to test our hydraulic gradient and grade to see if it performed any better. 
And so when we did this, um, we were basically able to see that the hydraulic gradient at the top and our grade here has a pretty good split that delineates between successful um, and unsuccessful openings. So our successful ones at the top, they um, all required a hydraulic gradient of 0.017 meters over meter or steeper, um, which equates to a grade of one in 60 um, or steeper. And then ones that were not as steep as that um, all tended to be unsuccessful. So we're able to pull out some thresholds that we can um, start to test further and hopefully use to help with decision making. But in looking at this, um, it isn't perfect and we do have some outliers in our data. So looking at grade here, these openings um, should have been successful uh, because the grade was steeper than one in 60, um, but they weren't. And so those outliers are largely attributed to openings that happen during really big waves. So our Ear River one at the start here um, is this point uh, here. So example of that again is Air River. It had a really steep grade of one in, uh, one in 15, but our waves offshore were nearly five meters high. So we attribute those outliers to big waves that essentially bring on so much sediment, it overwhelms uh, any outflow and infills the channel. So it tells us that it's, it's not just one thing alone, it's this critical balance, um, which we can look at wave height offshore and energy slope or grade um, at opening. And so using that data from our 137 openings, we started to put together um, this kind of semi-empirical model to predict when estuary openings will be successful or not. And so just stepping through this, um, what we've got here is basically our zone of failure. So any uh, opening that has a grade that is more gradual than one in 60, we would expect it to fail because in our data set, um, no openings really worked um, when they weren't that steep. When we look at waves here, waves was a pretty um, hard one to, to get a threshold for and it likely changes um, as the grade uh, changes. But in our data set, we had uh, no openings be successful when our wave height was 4.3 meters or higher. So we're still working on this, um, but just for now, that's kind of our threshold uh, of wave height. What we have in the middle is kind of a good area for openings. So our grade is steep enough that it has enough force to, to keep maintaining outflow and our waves are low enough that they won't infill the channel. We also observed our natural openings um, here to occur when the estuary was steeper, like not always the case, but mostly. And so at this point here in terms of management, if we have a grade that's one in 10 or higher, we could really just wait for a natural opening to occur unless there's emergency flooding or something happening um, that would minimize the risk to the environment. And then lastly, we have this uh, kind of gray zone in between a grade of one in 58 and one in 60. So we call this our zone of risk because some openings were successful here, um, others weren't, some opened but didn't drain their basins. So as we gather more data um, over time, this is kind of an area to, to focus on and look at other factors um, that might cause the split um, within this area. And so just to look at these two outliers, so these are two openings at the Air and Jellybrand River. Um, I, think, I think it was those two sites, we'll have a look, um, that didn't uh, work, but they were, they should have, they were had a grade that was steeper than one uh, in 60. So these two outliers here, a Jelly Brand River was open with a grade of one in 58 and air was one in 59. So they're in our zone of risk um, and they're kind of right on the cusp of failing. So to look at the reasons why they failed in more detail, um, both of these openings were implemented on a rising tide. So what we've got here, this is our, our high tide um, at zero. This is when the openings occurred. And so they both happened um, over six hours before the next uh, high tide. So as our tide is rising, um, our hydraulic head is decreasing um, over that tidal cycle. So our tides here played a big role, we think. Um, our grade was really close to the threshold, so it was quite risky, but because the estuary was losing, um, it's, it was decreasing in hydraulic head over this time, it meant that if they opened it and it hadn't got to a really strongly eroding state, um, that change in, in head uh, and grade could effectively uh, cause it to close. 
So what do we hope this will translate to um, is basically another um, thing or another tool for managers to use to help them decide when to open estuaries or not. And so we've got this um, model here that also spreadsheets where uh, managers can put in the wave height, the burn length, the tides and the water level and try to get um, these predictions. So looking at whether it will open or not. And one of the cool things that we think about this is that it's basically you don't need to spend any money to do it. And it can be used along existing tools um, as kind of another piece of information. So all they need to, or all people need to input into this um, are these variables up here, which can be done for free. Um, in berm length, you can easily step out or, or measure in the field. So we're just going to go through a test of this tool now. So we've got two openings happening at Curdie's Inlet in Western uh, Victoria. So this opening here happened on the 16th of June uh, in 2019. And what happened is this opening closed off about uh, two hours after um, the digger had finished digging. And then the next day, because the estuary was still flooding out um, parts of the town um, and the boat ramp, they came in again and re-implemented the opening. But in this case here, um, it worked. So it was flowing out really strongly and it drained its basin um, by about a meter or so. So during this opening, we went down during the middle of the night, um, kind of sat out on the beach and we're watching this opening happen. And it was really cool. There were these huge big standing waves going through and the velocities were up to, um, you know, almost four meters a second. So thinking about applying our tool, looking at um, the grade and the wave height to try to see why one worked and one didn't. So this is our first opening, um, the one that was unsuccessful. And so looking at testing our tool here, we have a grade that was over a one in 60 threshold and we had waves that were pretty high. So this opening here happened at this point and it was also implemented uh, on a rising tide where we saw a decreasing head. So we predicted um, to not work because of this grade threshold um, and that in fact was the case. Our next opening the next day that worked, um, they had a steeper grade of one in 37 and also our wave heights uh, had dropped. So we would predict uh, this one to work. And so what we can see as well is that the estuary was opened on a falling tide, um, which we think really just gave it that extra push um, to keep uh, incising um, and widening during those early stages of opening. So if we look at Curtis here, when it failed, it plotted out um, in this area of do not open. And then the next day, because of those changes in wave height and grade, we shift it to be um, in the good spot we would predict it to be successful. So this is still kind of a work in progress, um, but essentially it's a cheap and easy way to, to predict if estuaries will stay open, just given those physical uh, factors and, and processes. So my next bit um, of the talk I'm, I'm going to focus on is looking at geomorphic change um, that occurs once an estuary has been opened um, through to the point where it stops draining. So just to um, conceptualize this here, this is a model um, by Angus Gordon done uh, in the 90s based on observations of natural openings um, at estuaries in New South Wales. And so this is taking the change in channel width, lagoon water level um, and discharge. And I've just plotted these um, up here to make them a bit easier to see. So he talks about three different uh, stages um, during this opening. Initially, we have a, a small kind of channel that's dug out. Our threshold conditions for transport are only marginally exceeded. So it's kind of just ramping up during this stage and our water level doesn't change much. Then as we go into this middle stage, um, things really start to get exciting. We get big increases in channel width and discharge, supercritical flow, and our water level starts to fall. And then this last stage here um, is when things are starting uh, to taper out. So this was done um, based on observations of natural openings in New South Wales, um, but we kind of used it as a starting point to see if artificial openings um, follow the same sequence of, of changes. And so just to track through this here with an example from the Air River. So this was an artificial opening that happened um, during my PhD back in 2014. It came in and opened the site um, here when the water level was pretty high at about 2.1 meters. 
we looked at the change um, during this opening. So we had a gradual increase in width um, and velocity until it reached um, this point here and transitioned into our next stage. Uh, six hours after opening, things were really exciting. Um, we had big standing waves in the channel. Um, it had widened to at least 40 meters and our velocity uh, was about four meters uh, a second. And then over time, about 12 hours later, it had started to lose that really rapid outflow um, and things had started uh, to calm down. But we saw a decrease in water level of about a meter um, or so. So thinking about the relevance um, for this for artificial openings, essentially we want our opening to surpass this transport um, or this threshold condition here. So it's able to have enough energy um, to keep moving sediment uh, offshore. So we wanna think about not just in terms of um, observing these processes, um, but in terms of uh, management here. So can we predict uh, what will cause the estuary to ramp through these stages quick enough um, that it will keep uh, itself open? So what determines the rates of change and also drainage of the basin was one of the questions we looked at. And then because we're comparing between lots of different sites, um, we have potential to see if all estuaries follow the same temporal sequence uh, of change. So firstly, what did we do and, and how did we get this information? So I've monitored um, 18 openings um, so far, and it isn't always perfect. Um, it's quite tricky to get stuff in place, um, but we've tried to, as best as we can, continually monitor, um, monitor the, the water level of the basin. So that's probably the easy bit. We can put pressure transducers out in it. Um, a lot of these sites have really good telemetry gauges. Um, at the mouth, we focus on the inlet throat, so kind of the area where things are changing uh, most rapidly. And so here we try to measure velocity, the channel width and area discharge. Um, so a few different methods um, of doing that, which um, we've been trying to collect data and kind of compare between them. So we've used an ADCP here to, to look at channel morphology and discharge. Um, that one was okay. It uh, took a bit of work to get it going and working correctly. Um, we've used surveying when we can wade across the channel. When things get uh, too deep, we kind of just uh, shoot our laser range finder across there and average our measurements for width um, and do the best we can to um, estimate the depth. So this is pretty hard in practice. Um, we don't have a perfect data set, but it's enough to kind of compare between openings if we can add some errors to it. And then the last thing that we did um, was do some physiochemical uh, monitoring up in the basin. So one of my honor students, Callum Edwards, did a lot of work on this. And it's trying to link the timing of things like turnover in the water column and the breakdown of stratification to what's uh, happening at the mouth. So here's an example of some of the data we got. Um, this is an opening where we were actually able to keep wading across the channel and surveying. So we had from the time of opening, this is our water level through to the time of drainage when it's not decreasing anymore. And we we're able to get 16 or so measurements uh, during this time. This big gap in here um, was when we decided to call it a day um, and have a few hours of sleep. And then this here is just an example of some of the channel cross sections um, that we could get. So using um, these different openings that we've monitored so far, we wanted to see what determines the rates of change um, in terms of channel expansion, velocity, uh, and basin drainage. So we're thinking based on a lot of the stuff that's said in literature, those early stages of opening um, are really driven again by the grade or the steepness of that energy slope. So we found that our max velocity and our time to reach that max velocity um, correlated pretty well with the grade at opening. Um, was quite a, a bit of variability um, here. And that makes physical sense because it, it translates, um, or a steeper grade translates to more energy, faster outflow. And in terms of management, we're able to see it track through those initial stages quicker, where it's at risk of closing during big waves. We saw a pretty good correlation, um, well, an okay correlation with our channel width here, our rate of change. Um, this is just an average. And then with discharge, uh, not so much, mainly probably driven by uh, basin morphology um, and volume uh, of that. But in terms of our average uh, drainage rate, we found that the graded opening actually um, controls that uh, pretty well. 
But again, it's not perfect. And we attribute this variability um, in that relationship, likely due to the basin size um, and its morphology. So over time, we're trying to gather more and more of this data and, and hopefully make this um, data set a bit more robust by using different methods. So just uh, as an example of this, um, we did a couple of openings at the Ear River. And the two I'm going to compare between, um, basically, the only difference in these openings um, in terms of the geomorphic factors was the grade at opening. So this opening here was opened with a steep grade of, of 1 in 38. And so we'd predict it to drain quicker um, or to change a lot quicker than one that had a more gradual grade. So our water level uh, here, wave height, um, and also our upstream discharge is really similar to the one that we'll see next. So the main difference is just um, the grade here um, and also the fact that it was opened on a falling tide. So here's some of our field measurements that we're able to get during this opening. Um, what happened is it basically changed really quick um, and it drained its basin within uh, about 13 hours or so. So five hours after the opening, it was really uh, wide, flowing out really quick, and it was kind of on the falling limb uh, of its hydrograph. The next opening here, the only difference was, or the main difference was that we had a more gradual grade um, at opening. So same system, similar water levels, wave heights, and upstream discharge. And so what we saw with this one is that um, just looking at discharge, for instance, on the bottom, it took a long time to ramp up uh, to reach um, its maximum values. It took a bit longer to drain, um, about 24 hours or so. And our rates of change throughout this opening were kind of slower and also more variable. So here we can see that it's almost changing in relation to the tidal stage um, here. When we get our really, really low tide happening, that's when it started uh, to ramp up um, and change most rapidly. So our next question on this is, we've got data for these openings at different sites. Um, they're different sizes, different morphologies, um, and different degrees of infill. And so we want to start thinking about um, whether all uh, intermittent estuaries follow the same temporal sequence of change. So looking even just at those two sites, um, our data was suggesting that they don't. They actually change um, differently. And also the magnitude of the change um, is different as well. So this uh, picture here is work done from a flume uh, model study by Parkinson um, and Stretch out of South Africa. And so because it's so hard to get um, actual field data during estuary openings, there's not a lot of um, data sets out there that um, we can use to compare between sites. So we use this as kind of our hypothesis um, to, to see how estuaries change over time in terms of their channel dimensions, discharge, uh, and water level. And so this suggests some pretty uh, perfect um, curves here, but our data in reality was pretty messy um, and it didn't look like that. So this is kind of a work in progress um, and we're trying to compare between sites with different um, morphologies. So in particular, large estuaries um, that have big basins and low infill and then small estuaries, which tend to be quite steep, perched above sea level when they're opened, and most of them tend to be quite infilled. So these are kind of our two end members um, that we have uh, in Victoria. And so this is just showing uh, some of our, our field results for these sites. So first of all, our big systems, um, like Curtis and Let here, they tend to ramp up quite slowly. Um, they reach their peak values um, later during uh, the period of drainage. And they also, because they take so long to drain, uh, tend to get tidal um, during the drainage phase, uh, only when our velocity has dropped off enough um, that marine water can go back into the basin. And then looking at our smaller systems, because they tend to be really steep um, or perched when they're opened and small, Basically, they, they drain really quick, um, the rates of change um, are really high, and then they uh, taper off um, like this. So we're starting to put, um, we're starting to think about um, the model of Gordon um, from New South Wales for natural openings and compared to our artificial ones by putting these kind of geomorphic stages um, onto our opening sequence. 
And we're also starting to look and compare um, and group all our small perch systems and compare them to our larger, um, less infilled our estuaries to see if we can make sense of the way um, in which they track through this opening sequence. So last of all, some of our findings with this is in terms of rates of change during um, artificial openings, our hydraulic gradient and the grade um, actually are really uh, important. Our basin size and morphology uh, too um, is, is important as well. We tend to see differences between our small systems, um, which tend to be really perched when they're, they open. They usually in size widen uh, and drain uh, really quickly at least based on those kind of end members in Victoria. And our larger systems tend to drain a lot slower, um, potentially just because there's more water in the basin. Um, they tend to get tidal during the late stages of uh, drainage. And also the grade there is important in determining the rates of change. So thinking at um, about our air river example, where all variables were held constant-ish apart from the grade, we saw the steeper grade um, opening track a lot faster through um, the sequence of change. And we're also thinking about sedimentary infill as well. So that's going to change the volume and accommodation space of the basin with that essentially make um, you know, a larger system track more quickly through this because it would have less uh, water to drain. Um, and how would that work? So that's another consideration for uh, future work. And so in thinking about management here, we want to reduce the amount of re-implementation of openings um, to save cost, to save time, and to kind of minimize potential effects on the environment. So we found that if you want the estuary to open, stay open and drain, um, it should be opened at a 1 in 60 grade threshold uh, or steeper, and with waves um, that are as, as low as possible. But in reality, we're only coming at this from a geomorphic standpoint. Um, the issue of artificial openings is really complex um, in reality, and there are lots of other considerations um, as well. So one of those which gets quite tricky to, to balance um, with the need to get it to open and drain uh, is the risk of fish kills. So when estuaries are opened and they drain really quickly, if they're stratified at opening, they can have um, the, the DO, rich DO layer on the top and then low DO uh, on the bottom. So the, the high DO stuff, the fresh water just shares off the top and leaves all the stagnant uh, water behind and we, we see fish get killed. So we're advising that to get an estuary to stay open, we want it to drain quickly, but in reality, it's not uh, that simple. It's about kind of finding that um, balance. But what we hope to do with this research is to kind of for the first time provide some uh, geomorphic based advice um, that will help ensure that openings will stay open and we can reduce um, the need for re-implementation. So we're working on this at the moment um, with Kerangamite CMA and coming up with a kind of a guidance or framework to include this uh, information um, as a, another way of decision support. And so our thresholds that we've come up with uh, from our data, we strongly caution that they're just probably best uh, for emergency openings. And the main goal is to get water off the floodplain um, and make sure that the estuary drains. And they can also be ideally used in conjunction, in conjunction with other decision support tools. So for example, in Victoria, the EAM system here looks at the risks and benefits. So it brings in a lot of socioeconomic data um, and environmental factors uh, as well. They'll go out and test water quality and depth profiles before opening. So our thresholds here just really provide another part uh, to the equation that um, can be used to help with those decisions. And so the aim with this research, um, now I'm in New Zealand where the, some of the estuaries are a bit different, um, but there are still some sandy systems like this. What we're aiming to do is keep building this uh, data set to keep um, looking at geomorphic change during openings. So we can get enough um, openings that we can start to compare between them properly. Um, and potentially use it to test out our models as well. And then further research too is um, Callum Edwards, who worked um, at the University of Melbourne in 2020. He's got a really great data set um, during about 10 openings, actually linking a uh, physico-chemical change in the basin um, to these changes in the mouth. So trying to bring in that um, ecological uh, aspect as well um, into our research data. Cool. So that's all from me. Um, thank you so much for listening and happy to answer any questions.